Good afternoon, and welcome to the Senate. And members, please put press F1 on your computer. Thank you. <laughs> welcome to the Senate Environment, Natural Resources Policy, and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is Monday, February 28th, 2022, approximately 1 p.m. Today we have before us Senate File 3055. Welcome to the committee, Senator Housley. Uh, proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have before you um, Senate File 3055, but I do have an amendment, the A5 amendment. Members in front of you, you should have the A5 amendment. That's an author's amendment. Senator Weber, would you move the A5 amendment? So moved. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, motion carried. Senator Housley, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you probably have heard over the well, last couple of decades about the water levels at White Bear Lake. Uh, they've been in significant decline since 2000. Um, the Homeowners Association sued the DNR, arguing that the cause of this decline was too much groundwater withdrawal, especially tied to lawn watering. Um, the litigation lasted several years, uh, and in 2017, the district court found in favor of the plaintiffs and ordered a number of restrictions and requirements for the DNR to implement. Uh, the DNR was required to amend the existing groundwater permits within a five-mile radius of White Bear Lake with the following stipulations. Uh, they require a residential irrigation ban when the water level of White Bear Lake drops between 92 923.5 feet, and the ban remains in effect until the water level reaches 924 feet. Uh, it also required that the permittees uh, develop a per capita water plan, use plan to reduce residential per capita water use to 75 gallons per day, and a total capita water use to 90 gallons per day. And it also required that public water suppliers develop a contingency plan to shift their source of water from groundwater to surface water. Uh, and all of the permittees were required to report to the DNR annually on their collaborative efforts uh, with other North and East Metro uh, communities. And then the DNR was required to analyze the maximum authorized volumes in the groundwater use permits within that five mile radius of White Bear Lake and evaluate the impact of that use of the water levels on the lake and then set a collective annual withdrawal limit for White Bear Lake. So that analysis recently revealed, I think it was February 7th, that a limit of 55 gallons per day per person based on the 2020 census info, leaving no water for the schools, hospitals, medical offices, government buildings, commercial uses such as restaurants, gas stations, grocery stores, or any other store, hotel, um, or egg uses. So what this legislation does is it allows cities within five miles of the White Bear Lake um, to continue to operate with respect to the wells and water appropriations under the water supply plan that was approved by the DNR before 2021 in conjunction with the 2040 comprehensive plans provided that their operations are consistent with that plan. Uh, it won't allow, it will not allow for another lawsuit to be brought uh, using this same statute. And it requires that the DNR, MDH, Met Council, and representatives of the East Metro's communities to form a work group to explore options available for supplying safe drinking water to these cities. Uh, the bill sunsets January 1st, 2041, um, in, in uh, concurrence with the 2040 comprehensive plan. So what the bill did not address and what this amendment addressed is it didn't address the non-municipal permits. Uh, so the amendment does this to provide protections to those non-permitted um, um, non-municipal permittees. And I want to thank Mr. Stanley for working with the stakeholders uh, diligently over the weekend and uh, today to get us this A5 amendment. Um, and I do have some testifiers, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Howley. I, Howley, I see uh, you, your first two testifiers are uh, Brian Baer and Christina Hand, if they'd like to come up to the table. Thank you, and welcome to the committee today. If you would uh, identify yourself for the record, I believe uh, Mr. Baer is to go first. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, Senators. My name is Brian Baer. I'm the Hugo City Administrator. Proceed when you're ready, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Suddenly, here we are, we're talking about, um, in the Northeast Metro, protection of drinking water. Our drinking water is being threatened. And uh, never thought we'd actually be in this position, but here we are. I've been in the city of Hugo now for 18 years, and I've watched this issue slowly unfold. And I'd like to provide a little bit of background um, and, and a little bit of perspective on this issue. This is a really important topic for all communities in the Northeast Metro. And uh, we'd, we're in a position where we really need your help. I've been watching this issue, as I say, from the very beginning. And we've been watching it from the sidelines. Normally, when we're talking about new rules or policy that affects cities, something so, so important as how we use our water, there's an ability for us to engage in the debate. We can have some influence over those rules. Sometimes rules don't make any sense at all from a practitioner standpoint. And so we get engaged, we get involved, and there's sort of a deliberative legislative process that goes in, involved in, that gets involved in creating rules and policy. That didn't happen in this case. We just sit and watch on the sidelines because the rules are being designed in this case by a court. This is concerning a case that we are not a party to, not the city of Hugo and not most of the cities in the Northeast Metro, but we are certainly impacted by it in a very significant way. We'd prefer that there be a policy discussion that happened through that deliberative legislative process led by policymakers. So one of the most basic and fundamental things that we do as cities is we supply drinking water to businesses, to homes, industry, restaurants, schools, hospitals, you name it. And we do a good job. The water is reliable, it's affordable, and it's clean. People don't give it a, a second thought. We get our water from the ground and submit water supply plans for approval by the DNR, and that governs our use of the water. We rely on that information and those plans to supply water and manage growth. So what's happened? A long time ago, landowners sued the DNR over the level of White Bear Lake. The claim is that the DNR mismanaged the resource, allowing the level of the lake to drop. Those are several hundred feet deep. So as we extract water from the ground, the theory is that eventually pulls water out of the bottom of the lake and that impacts the lake level, okay? And this is a court case where this is being debated. So who's involved? Well, the plaintiffs are landowners on the lake. What do they want? Well, you have to read the pleadings in the case to know what they want. And what they want is to reduce or eliminate municipal water use permits. It's exactly what it says. In other words, the cities are directly to blame for draining the lake. And they want to limit municipal use of drinking water to theoretically increase the water level of the lake. The defendants, of course, are the DNR. They also want to reduce the amount of water that cities use. Their objective is to conserve, preserve, and protect the resource. Our mayor has famously said, it's almost as if the DNR in this case has sued themselves because they and the plaintiffs want some of the exact same things. It's a very bizarre setup. The judge's verdict, of course, agreed with the plaintiffs. So municipal pumping drains the lake, that's the verdict. But the lake, is it really in trouble? What we know and what the DNR has told us is that the lake has fluctuated up and down throughout recorded history. Decades ago, we know that the lake was artificially augmented with water pumped from groundwater wells because it was low. Think about that. The constructed outlet, that's the thing that controls the lake elevation, was changed at least twice in history. It was lowered both times. The DNR concludes that lake ecology is healthy in White Bear Lake with fluctuating water levels. So in other words, the fish, the birds, the plants, the bugs, they all do better with periodic changes to the lake elevation. But low lake levels are impactful for recreation uses. So navigating on the lake with your boat, the use of the boat launch, the use of the public beach, the need for private docks to be extended. 
We know that the lake has a very shallow shelf around its edge, so that small fluctuations in lake level changes tend to be very noticeable, exposing mud flats around the edge of the lake. The impacts to the lake are recreational in nature. Okay. Back to the verdict. This could have been sent back to the DNR with direction to create policy, create new rules, use the process that we're all familiar with and comfortable with to create a positive effect on lake levels if possible. Instead, the judge created the rules. The judge created the rules and the rules are inside the verdict of the case. The judge ordered the DNR to change all of our water use permits in the Northeast Metro. And the DNR has done that. And they plan to do it again. So what did the court order do? The things that the court did without following the typical legislative process don't make any sense to us, and we don't think they help. The court established a magic five-mile line around the lake. So wells that are inside that line are impacted. Presumably, they drain the lake. And new wells are prohibited. You can't drill new wells within five miles. But outside that line, wells are not impacted just a few feet away from the ones that might be impacted, okay? The line is exactly 5.0 miles in a concentric circle around the lake, according to the court order. There's no regard to the shape of the land, the geology under the ground, the flow characteristics of groundwater, things that might be really important if you're gonna establish who's affected and who isn't affected by something as complicated as this issue. But it isn't. There's no explanation of why it's exactly 5.0 miles. Record is very weak, almost as if the line just magically appeared. The court also created these per capita limits on water usage. The DNR then changed our water permits to limit use on a gallons per person day. And that, in our view, is irresponsible. Let me illustrate. We have, a, we have a school that's being constructed in the city of Hugo for 720 kids. Okay, that school is gonna use a lot of water. Using a lot of water, according to this formula, is not good. By all rights, we should not allow that school. It would be bad according to the policy, according to the formula. However, we can make it better by adding apartments because the, gal the formula is gallons per capita. If we were to add apartments and use more water, we would do better under this formula. We do even better if we eliminate the school in the first place and just build the apartments. Okay? It doesn't make any sense to us, but that's in the court order and that's what we have to live with. Okay? It also created the bizarre irrigation bans, only applying to certain users and based on timing of lake level fluctuations which we don't think has any scientific validity. We believe, and so does the DNR, that this cannot have a meaningful impact on lake levels. There are other problems in the court order, but you get the point. The changes are impactful, and so 12 cities and a number of businesses have challenged those changes. But before that issue can be resolved through that process, the DNR is already preparing for the next round of permit changes that are again consistent with the court ruling. Those changes would reduce total water usage in the area 40% from existing levels. So think about the water that we already use right now and just reduce it 40% from where it is. What do you have left? What, what's left to work with? Well, that potentially means no water left for businesses, restaurants, churches, schools, hospitals, the only water that you can have available is that for in-home domestic use. So think cooking, drinking, bathing. That's all. And it's not because there isn't enough water. It's only because a judge says our water use is connected to a lake elevation. Okay? We are not sure this cycle of court-ordered changes will stop. There's no reason to think it should. And it's becoming hard to function in this environment. How do we function as communities? We need that to stop. In the city of Hugo specifically, we do not believe that we have the capability to influence that lake level. No matter what we do, we can't influence it up or down. That's our strong belief based on everything that we can see. 
If we do all of the things that the judge and the DNR have now ordered, there is no guarantee that it will help the lake. In fact, we believe those changes in Hugo will have no effect. The changes will be very impactful, but we don't believe they will help the lake. The city of Hugo is really good at managing water. We're proud of it. This is what we do. It's a priority of ours. Our mayor and our council has set this as a top priority for us. And we do this better than anyone. We'll put our record up against anyone in the state of Minnesota when it comes to effective management of water. If anything, we're helping the situation more than hurting it. We use stormwater whenever we can. Last year, our city used over 50 million gallons of it in a year when it was dry and there was hardly any storm water. This next year I'd expect we'll use a lot more. We're preventing that storm water runoff and allowing water to percolate back into the ground to replenish the aquifer in ways that never used to happen. And we're conserving our use of drinking water in very significant ways. We would love to participate in a discussion about responsible water use, but we can't seem to get involved in that discussion. The rules just uh, get ordered. Um, if we lost access to drinking water, where could it come from? The court ordered us to evaluate alternatives and to start planning for it. Well, eight years ago, the Met Council has given us this answer. They said that it would cost $620 million to, to construct an alternative water supply for the city of Hugo. Water would come from the Mississippi River. Now at that time, that's about 100 times our annual budget. Clearly, it is not feasible. So basically, we're here, we're talking to you. We need help from the legislature to get through this. It's not just Hugo. It's hard for the entire Northeast Metro to function without reliable access to drinking water. This bill will allow time for policymakers to address water supply concerns and address lake levels. Maybe there's a remedy somewhere through this discussion that finds whatever that right balance is. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Baer. Um, members, before we have questions, I think we'll let um, our Lake Elmo administrator welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself and proceed when you're ready. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Christina Hant, and I've been the administrator for the city of Lake Elmo for the last six years. <clears throat> Thank you for taking the time to consider Senate File 3055 today and allowing us to share our perspectives. This bill is supported by the cities of Lake Elmo, Hugo, Lionel Lakes, White Bear Lake, Oakdale, Stillwater, Matamidi, Vadnais Heights, and North St. Paul. Many of my colleagues from those communities are with us today. Some you'll hear from and others are happy to answer any questions you might have. Up until a few years ago, Lake Elmo was a large lot rural agricultural community. In the late 90s, early 2000s, the Metropolitan Council mandated that Lake Elmo grow with smaller sewered lots and average at least three units per acre in those areas. The city wanted to retain its rural character and resisted Met Council's mandates until a Supreme Court ruling said we no longer could. Around that same time as the Supreme Court ruling, PFAS was discovered in the groundwater in Lake Elmo and other neighboring communities. We were fortunate in that the contamination did not impact any of our municipal wells at that time. But in response to the PFAS, the city had to alter its water supply plan to abandon a well and remove any future planning for wells in the southern part of the city where the contamination was prevalent. We have identified our future well locations in the northern third of the city for years, long before the lawsuit was filed regarding White Bear Lake. Lake Elmo invested millions in this plan in building out our distribution system from north to south. With the White Bear Lake Court ruling in 2017, we were suddenly unable to access the, most of the safe drinking water in our community for future wells since we fell within five miles of White Bear Lake. When we did have to shut down a municipal well in 2018 due to PFAS contamination, we were able to locate a new well just outside the five mile radius, though we did have to sacrifice a soccer field to do so. We understand that recreation is important, but it's not more important than having access to water. Despite the new well being larger than the one we closed, DNR analysis showed it wouldn't negatively impact White Bear Lake. We worked cooperatively with the state on the new well, with the state picking up 90% of the cost funded through this 3M settlement. When the well was ready to be permitted and come online, 
the city applied for an amendment to our water appropriations permit to not only add the newer high capacity well, but to also increase our annual appropriation amount. In early 2021, the DNR approved the new well, but the increase in the appropriation was denied due to the court case. Lake Elmo's current appropriation amount of 260 million gallons was approved in 2014. Around the 2013-2014 timeframe, the city began approving plats for that mandated sewer growth. Since that time, we've added about 1,500 new homes, 300 apartment units, and many new businesses. We can't continue without an increase in the appropriation amount when we have this much growth. We can't move our wells outside of the five mile radius without having to deal with PFAS. We need the legislature to help us manage through these conflicting directives, not only from state agencies, but from the state courts. And we need a solution soon, as we should be beginning the process of preparing for a new well next year. We aren't looking to harm White Bear Lake and understand that cities play a role in conservation. With the help of Met Council water efficiency grants, we've installed over 140 smart irrigation controllers and high efficiency toilets over the last two years, saving about a million gallons of water annually. Conservation alone won't prevent White Bear Lake levels from dropping, especially in years of drought. Data shows the lake has a long history of ups and downs over the last century. While many involved in this issue may spend time arguing over whose model is better or more correct, city officials are left to deal with what's happening in real time. In 2019 and 2020, White Bear Lake was at historic highs. At the same time, property owners in Lake Elmo were dealing with historic flooding issues. Not because our lakes were full or water was topping over any riverbanks, but because the groundwater table was so high, it was literally coming up through people's basements. The watershed district had to pump water out of many of our landlocked basins and eventually send it to the St. Croix River. I begged them to send it to White Bear Lake so we wouldn't have to worry about those lake levels falling, but apparently that wasn't an option. In contrast, you may remember 2021, we saw statewide drought conditions. In June of last year, Lake Elmo issued an emergency watering ban even when the ban was lifted after a few weeks, we only did so after permanently reducing the number of hours a day that folks could irrigate their lawns. Our staff vigorously enforced these bans in 2021, not because we were required to do so by the court order to protect White Bear Lake, that letter from the DNR didn't come till October, but because we were worried about the health and safety of our community when we saw our existing wells could not keep up with demand. Lake Elmo needs a new well soon. Over about a four month period, our staff issued warnings and violations to nearly 400 properties. Over 50 of those properties received multiple violations, some as many as four times. And as I said, despite all these efforts, on October 21st, 2021, we received the letter from the DNR that White Bear Lake had dropped below the 923.5 elevation, triggering a watering ban. Another example of how conservation and irrigation bans alone won't solve the lake level issue. You may also remember last year that statewide drought conditions, water restrictions were, placed, were in place for many communities drawing from the Mississippi River. So I struggle to understand how some can so easily point to moving more communities to that surface water source as a solution. To me, it just seems like trading one water body for another. I don't come to you today with a permanent solution to the White Bear Lake issue. It's obviously a very complicated issue, and if a solution was easy to find, we wouldn't still be struggling a decade after the lawsuit was filed by the plaintiffs. But I do know we have to do something and can't let things move forward under the DNR's most recent analysis that limits us to 55 gallons per person per day based upon 2020 population numbers, a population number Lake Elmo has already exceeded. We can't cut off water supplies to our schools, hospitals, medical offices, government buildings, or to commercial uses like restaurants, gas stations, grocery stores, or any other store, our hotels, or industrial and agricultural uses. In Lake Elmo alone, we have three school buildings, many medical offices, and over 300 businesses. Of the communities that are directly impacted by this court order, we are the second smallest so you can easily multiply that number by 10 or more to understand the impact this court ruling has on the East Metro. Again, I wanna reiterate that cities do have a role to play in water conservation. In Lake Elmo, we will continue to push water efficiency fixtures, monitor our irrigation hours closely, and the city council will continue discussions on adding requirements for future developments to reduce water use. I just hope you all keep that in mind when you hear from the 
housing community and the developers about all of these expensive regulations that local communities are putting on them. Once again, cities are just caught in the middle. On an individual level, as a resident of White Bear Township, I can commit to not always turning on my irrigation system, even if the lake level is above the trigger elevation, while the work group continues to look for a more permanent solution. My neighbors give me weird looks when they ask why I don't use it. My response is we have to worry about the level of White Bear Lake. This issue is just too complicated for the average person to understand. But I'll take their weird looks if it means we aren't shutting down their medical facilities, grocery stores, and schools. I hope you'll move Senate File 3055 forward and allow new voices to be part of the conversation as we look for a way to preserve community growth, health, and safety while also ensuring the sustainability and quality of the state's water resources. Again, thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Members, are there any questions for either Mr. Baer or Ms. Hunt? Senator Madam Weber. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Hunt, uh, you mentioned that you previously had a um, requirement that our rule that there would be no more than three residences per uh, acre. Is that correct? Ms. Hand. Uh, Senator, Madam Chair, committee members, it's a minimum of at least three units per acre is the Met Council oh, requirement. Three units so it per could acre. be higher, yeah, okay. but it's a minimum of three in our sewer areas. And you said the Met Council overruled that? Ms. Hand. Uh, Senator, Madam Chair, and committee members, the Met Council is the one who required that of Lake Elmo and took, took us to district court and ultimately the Supreme Court who upheld Met Council's ruling that we develop at higher densities. Senator Weber. Madam Chair, I just always seem to be amazed at the, how the Met Council seems to create more problems than it solves. Thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you for, for our testifiers. Appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Senator McEwen has a question. Senator McEwen. You're on mute, Senator McEwen. Senator McEwen, do you have F1 pressed? No. Senator McEwen, we'll come back to you while we figure out this technical problem. Uh, with that, I'll welcome our uh, next two testifiers to the table. We have Mr. Reinke, the mayor of Oakdale, and also Katie Smith uh, from the DNR. <coughs> Welcome. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed when you're ready. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senators. My name is Paul Reinke. I'm the mayor of Oakdale, uh, currently serving my sixth year. Uh, prior to that was a council member for um, uh, 12. The, um, I guess I wanted to say on behalf of the taxpayers of uh, Oakdale, both the residences and the business owners, I um, appreciate the opportunity to come here to speak on this, this file. I also want to express thanks to Senator Housley for initiating this Senate file. Um, Mr. Mayor, could I interrupt one moment and have you pull the microphone just a little closer? We would love to hear your comments. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. How is this now? Perfect. Wow, it seems like it's boom. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you again. Um, you know, my colleagues in front of me, um, uh, Ms. Hahn and uh, Mr. Bear, did a nice job expressing the specific issues, so I'm not going to go into redundancy again. Um, but I do want to say that uh, without this bill and the opportunity to collaboratively figure out a better process, um, all of our taxpayers, uh, the quality of their lives will be affected negatively. Um, new developments, uh, ranging from the recently approved 71-unit uh, subsidized housing unit um, up there by the uh, Gold Line BRT. This is a cool development that has got uh, a conscientiously designed uh, process for people with disabilities to house and uh, live with people, uh, able-bodied people. So that, that potentially has a dis, um, uh, uh, negative impact because of this uh, judge's ruling. 
And then it also goes all the way up to the um, 1,400 unit development, uh, uh, market rate development, just on the north side of the old Emation headquarters. This is currently called Forefront. So again, this is an important bill. The opportunity to actually collaboratively uh, look at the issues and the implications of the various areas and how we best get our uh, drinking water without harming uh, White Bear Lake or the, um, the envir environmental species is really important. And I totally support this and hope you do too. I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, with that, Ms. Smith, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Katie Smith and I'm the Director of Ecological and Water Resources at um, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. The bill appears to be in response to DNR's implementation of the Ramsey County Court Order. The order requires DNR to set a collective annual withdrawal limit for White Bear Lake and to limit groundwater appropriations within five miles of White Bear Lake to the amount necessary to accomplish two outcomes. First, that the withdrawals be limited to ensure that the aquifer is available for future generations. And second, that the withdrawals be limited so as to keep White Bear Lake above a protective elevation of 922 feet. Of these two outcomes, the requirement to maintain White Bear Lake at a protective elevation of 922 feet will require far greater restrictions on groundwater withdrawals than would be needed if only the consideration was the impacts of the water appropriations on the aquifer itself. DNR agrees and understands that the permit changes DNR would need to make to implement the court order would have significant implications to communities, and DNR shares in these concerns for the well-being of the communities. DNR has concerns with this proposal because the requirement to approve permits directs DNR to disregard our obligation to ensure the statutory sustainability and protection of surface water standards are met. These provisions need to be considered to ensure the health of ecosystems, water quality, use for future generations of households, and riparian uses. 2041 is a long time away, and in the meantime, municipalities are likely looking to make changes to their systems that would then most likely be replaced. What's proposed in Section 7 has already been completed. DNR does think some additional language is warranted to provide specific direction to develop details on governance, engineering, and funding which would be helpful to develop a path forward on an alternative solution through, for example, augmentation or a surface water source. The executive branch and legislature and communities need to work together on an alternative strategy that complies with the court order and statutory requirements to resolve the long-term water supply need for the area. Thank you. Thank you. Members, other questions? Senator McEwen, I, um, I believe you were up next. Uh, have you, do we, have we solved our technical problems? Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hello, Madam Chair, thank you very much. My question is for the, is for the bill's author. I, I, I'll, I'll wait until the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator McEwen, we're done with testifiers here, so um, you're welcome to, okay. to ask the bill's author a question. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just have a, a couple of questions. Obviously, this is a very complex issue, and um, thank you to the testifiers today to uh, educate those of us who haven't been following this very closely about the concerns. And um, I just have some some questions um, for clarification. Um, I'm I'm a little bit concerned because this seems to be a harbinger of things to come. I hope it's not, but I think that. Um, this is um, what the climate crisis has in store for us in terms of our water resources. So, and, and what I'm what I'm worried about are these carve outs and how they're going to if if they're going to have unintended consequences for the rest of us in the state. So, I'm wondering um, if we know what the statewide impact will be on water resources with this bill. Senator Housley. Um, Madam Chair and Senator McEwen, what the statewide cap would be? Senator McEwen. What the state, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Housley. Um, um, I'm sorry for, I'll clarify. Um, what, what is the statewide impact on water resources in the state for this, with this bill? Is there a statewide impact? 
Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator McEwen. Um, right now, this is just focusing on the White Bear Lake, and again, uh, the bill would require that the, um, the DNR, MDH, Met Council, and everyone in the East Metro cities collaborate on a, a water plan, uh, and then I'm sure they'll take it out to the next level for statewide, but it's just getting all the stakeholders together to um, explore the options that are available and the impact on, on the state. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Housley. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, to understand this a little bit better. H how does the bill solve the water resource problem in White Bear Lake? Because it, it does it does it do that, or is there still with this bill a water resource problem that we're dealing with? Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to have uh, Mr. Bayer from Hugo. Mr. Bayer, welcome back to the committee, and please re-identify yourself. Madam Chair, Brian Bayer, City of Hugo. Um, I think I can help with that answer. Um, first, you mentioned the, uh, the effect of climate change. And it's an interesting question because um, climate change, it seems, may have something to do with the lake level of White Bear Lake. The real question surrounding this topic is, what can the cities do to specifically help this question? And this has been studied by the court in a very non-scientific review of statutes. And in our view, individually, city by city, the effect has not been fully evaluated. And so when we look at that from our standpoint in our city, no matter what we do, we're having a hard time coming to a solution that where we can help the lake. So if the lake needs help, it may be that there's a solution that we are not capable of providing. The, uh, if there's a solution that involves construction of a pipe, for example, to fill up the lake with water, that could be a solution. Um, it isn't a solution that the city of Hugo can provide or any single community can do. Um, there's a discussion that would need to occur that I think should happen with, uh, you know, with policymakers involved for, at the state level to determine what those solutions may be. So environmental consequences for sure and environmental policy crossed with economic policy and social policy are all what we're talking about here and it's a very significant discussion. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And, and it does seem to me that we are in a spot where we need some real comprehensive water resource planning for the entire state um, to figure out how we're going to do this. When we're talking about filling up a lake, you know, where does the water come from from that fill up? And and um, this is going to be a huge issue going forward. I have just a follow up. Um, if you're going to be guaranteeing water permits with this bill, I'm I'm wondering then what happens to the already strained lake and the water, I mean, it, it seems that if you're guaranteeing those permits, it, is there an answer to that? Senator Housley or Mr. Bear? Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator. Um, I think that the, the way that I would look at that is that communities do a lot of work on the front end as we balance the various things concerning the planning and the growth of our communities. There's a lot of things that we need in order to accommodate that growth. We need, obviously, many different forms of infrastructure and access to drinking water is an obvious one. And so we identify those resources in a water supply plan that we submit to the DNR and that plan is approved. We'd like to rely on that plan if there's a, a reason for us to go back and have discussions again about um, how to responsibly use water in connection with this issue, glad to do it. Um, but in terms of us um, anticipating that a permit, a specific permit that might be issued for the city of Hugo, if it's in conformance with our water supply plan, in a way we feel like that that makes sense if there's a different plan that needs to be created, well, let's have that discussion. But for what we know right now, the documents that we have, the planning that we have, 
it all makes sense. And um, the effect on the lake is something that presumably should be included if there's a way that if there's a way that we can benefit that in some way, shape, or form, let's keep talking about that. But um, very difficult for us to come to terms with that, just permit by permit. Thank you. Senator McEwen. Thank you for that. Um, my next question is um, for um, Senator Housley. Um, how does this bill impact a citizen's right to petition a water appropriation permit? Senator Housley. Um, Madam Chair and Senator McEwen, I don't think it does impact the citizen's right to petition. Senator McEwen. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Housley. Thank you. As Senator Hur. Um, thank, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Housley. Um, I wonder, could that be resolved um, with the DNR without this legislation? I know that you know, there's um, people are getting impatient, and that's why, you know, we're putting this legislation forth, but I wonder, can it be resolved between the city and the, the DNR without legislation? Senator Housley. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Her, I am under the feeling that the DNR would, would, it would help them if there was some legislation, but I could have the DNR respond if they'd like to. Ms. Smith. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, um, yes, the DNR would agree um, with some additional language and guidance um, that would encompass, you know, engineering, funding, um, an analysis of different alternatives that would be helpful. Um, Senator Her. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I do care about the quality of water, especially White Bear and Lake. It's not that far from, you know, the district that I represent, you know, and uh, uh, people need to have quality water. Um, and I know that uh, one of the testifier, I think, uh, from Lake Elmo, talk about escaping from uh, uh, PFAT, con contamination, you know, it's, it's sad that, you know, our current, current status, we have to deal with chemical and find, you know, drinkable water. And so I really want to fight for the citizen of the city, you know, that uh, a white bear late. Uh, but I just wonder if there's... Um, Study need to be more study need to be done before we put into legislation. You know, like an old saying, and it's not an old saying of my culture, but like, uh, you know, are we putting the horse ahead of uh, ahead? Of, uh, I mean, are we putting a cart ahead of the horse? <laughs> Very yeah, good, sure. Senator. Her. <laughs> Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Her. I think. Uh, that point exactly, and that's what will happen going forward, except right now with the, with the way that the previous um, uh, court order was to the DNR, it, the cities are getting conflicting um, orders. So this would at least lift that and allow for all of the stakeholders to, again, collaborate um, going forward for the, uh, protecting the, the levels of White Bear Lake. Senator Herr. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Housley, for your answer. You know, I um, I don't have any follow-up question, but I, I re heard uh, Ms. Smith uh, mention that you know there's there may be possibility there. So um, I'm I'm not you know I'm I'm neutral on this, but you know I I wish that there's something can be worked out without putting this legislation forward. Thank you. Members, that's Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Senator Herr, I think, you know, as we look at this, I don't think that this legislation is intended to produce any type of blame on the DNR. They're basically following the judge's orders at this point. Um, and unless we step in 
and produce legislation that in some respects sets aside those judges' orders, neither the DNR and, nor the communities can work together to establish a plan that, that actually, number one, meets the needs of the citizens of these communities, as well as the, um, as well as the environmental concerns as it relates to the lake itself. And, um, and I think, as Senator Housley stated, it, it was really the court that put the cart ahead of the horse in this situation and tied the hands of everybody to sit down and actually work out a, a, work, uh, a meaningful solution to the problem. And, um, and so, uh, I think, quite frankly, that's not the first time uh, we've had the courts do that. And quite frankly, it's one of the few times that I've probably said the DNR isn't to blame. Uh, but um, uh, at that point, I think we, uh, we should actually support this bill and, and allow that uh, type of cooperation to occur. Senator Weber, I think that was very well stated, at what, you know, what the problem is and where we're going forward and how we have to work together. And this is the only opportunity that we have uh, that allows all the stakeholders to have a voice. And I think that's all that they are really asking to do. Uh, they want a place at the table where they have not had a place before. And if we're going to allow our communities, uh, we talk about local government control, we talk about what a good job that they do in their communities, and who knows their communities better than they do. And I think uh, yeah, you're very correct that the DNR is put in this position by the courts. And so this, uh, I, I think this bill go, goes forward, does a lot to allow all the stakeholders to have a collaboration. And with that, I see Ms. Hantier back at the table. Madam Chair and committee members, I just wanted to address that question about the timing of it and putting the horse, horse before the cart, cart before the horse. <laughs> I got it wrong too. Um, you know, you've heard a lot about the history and there's been all this meeting and discussion going on. Why it's so timely for Lake Elmo is because we had our permit amendment denied last year. We're gonna continue to go over our appropriation, continue to apply for permit amendments. We need to have another well. As I told you in my example earlier, it takes two to three years from the time you start to plan until that well is online. And so I just wanted to make sure that that came across that for Lake Elmo, it is very timely that we have this legislation that allows us to continue to operate under our already approved water supply plan. We're not asking for anything more than what was already approved in those plans. Thank you. Thank you. Members, are there any more questions? Yes, sir. Senator Weber. Ms. Hunt. Um, with the issues that are there as far as available water, um, are you granted any type of relief from Met Council requirements that you go ahead and, and, and uh, populate your community at greater levels than what you originally wished to? Ms. Hand. Uh, Senator, uh, Madam Chair, and committee members, the floodgates have already been opened, I, I'm afraid to say. You know, we, we just approved our 2040 comp plan that shows where that sewer growth is. Um, my understanding is we cannot shrink where that is, um, but you know we also have property rights of folks in our community to take in mind too that they'd been planning for this and being allowed to do that. So um, again, we've we've got a, a lot of development happening in Lake Elmo, and I think it would be really hard to stop that. Very good, thank you, Senator Weber. Um, I do see uh, Senator McEwen, your hand is raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Go proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, 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 I note, um, I, I hear that concern about wanting to have this um, exemption in place while these things are taking place over these next years. But what I'm, I'm seeing in this bill, this, this creates a 20 year exemption. I'm, I'm just a little bit concerned about the length of exemption that we're creating when we don't really know what to do about the problem overall. I wish it was a little bit shorter. I think I'd be more comfortable with it. Um, and again, I, I, I just, I, I think we need, we need a bigger look at this. And so I'm, I'm concerned about putting something in place um, to unilater unilaterally act on like this on these permits and have this exemption be for 20 years when we have this bigger, deeper problem that we need to, to really get some answers on. So thanks everybody for the information. Senator McEwen, is there a question there or just make Just a comment. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. Senator Herr. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I, again, I'm saying neutral to this bill and, uh, but um, depending on where it moved to, um, probably go straight to the floor or, you know, is it 
is going to uh, stay in local government, Madam uh, Chair. Senator Hur, this bill will go straight to the floor. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still neutral, but I think there's more to it than just this legislation. You know, um, sometime I was just wondering during drought season uh, whether the, the, this will change the dynamic and the implication of our legislation. Um, and, you know, Senator Weber, uh, thanks to him, did bring up um, the perspective of Met Council. Um, as we move forward with the legislation, perhaps, you know, then we will need more involvement from Met Council and also the DNR and all the stakeholders that are in place. But again, my, my point still remain neutral on this and um, not going to vote yay or nay for it, but I, I just thought I'd make my point. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Herr. Are there any further discussion? Senator Senjum. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I, uh, I certainly don't live in White Bear Lake, but I, I, I well recall, I think it was 2012, uh, I was majority leader and I had a, uh, the Chamber of Commerce invited me out to a, a place out in White Bear Lake uh, uh, to, uh, to do a little dinner speech and so on and so forth. And uh, so you give your speech and uh, uh, the first question was, well, what are you going to do about your lake? Well, I, I, I didn't include anything in my speech about the lake. I had no idea about the lake. Uh, and, uh, and so I said, what's wrong with the lake? And, well, it doesn't have any water on it, in it. And, and I said, well, what do you mean? I just, coming up here on Highway 61, there's, I just realized it's, there's, there's, a, there's a gem lake or something like this before you get to White Bear Lake. I mean, that, that lake was, like, full of water. There's water in the ditches and so on and so forth. It, didn't quite understand what they were talking about because I thought this other lake was part of White Bear Lake and it was fully full of water. And uh, uh, so I did, after the speech, go out and, and look at the White Bear Lake and yeah, it was pretty low. Uh, but, and, 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 a, and a lot of this churn has happened to certainly since this, including this court case. But, but I, fully, I, I fully believe that this people in the White Bear Lake community, uh, uh, all involved, can certainly put together a, a water plan that can uh, work a, a certainly a lot better than, 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 in this case, the judge can do. And uh, I thought we, I, I think we need to advance this bill and, and, and let that happen. I think that's that's an important aspect of local government. That's what local governments do. Uh, courts do court. Local governments do things like water and traffic and uh, wastewater and things like that. And uh, I'm fully supportive of the fact that, uh, given the chance, uh, the communities out there can figure this out. Thank you. Any further discussion? Senator Housley, closing comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. And I want to thank my testifiers for being here today. It is a very complicated issue. Um, and I think all of us learned some more today. I also want to thank Senator Chamberlain for co-authoring it with me. He also represents part of this community. Um, it is. Local governments can do a better job of... of uh, taking care of their communities, and there's nobody who cares about the, the water levels of White Bear Lake than those folks who actually live in the community. Um, so let's not tie the hands of our, our local municipalities. Let's help the DNR get them some language. Uh, and it's a win-win <laughs> for everybody, and we can get this sent to the floor. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for hearing this bill today. Thank you, Senator Housley, and thank you to your testifiers today. Senator Weber, would you like to make a motion to move the bill to the floor? So moved. Senator Weber moves, as amended, Senator Weber moves that Senate File 3055, as, as amended, be recommended to pass and sent to the floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Senator Housley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, next up we have the OLA uh, Petroleum Redi Redi Remediation Report. And I believe uh, Judy Randall, welcome to the uh, committee and uh, proceed when you're ready. Um, please identify yourself for the record. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members. For the record, my name is Judy Randall. I'm the Legislative Auditor. And um, with me, I have Caitlin Badger. She's here remotely. So um, we're going to test the hybrid meeting, I think, to its fullest today. Um, pleased to be here today to discuss our recent evaluation report on the Petroleum Remediation Program. Hopefully, you all have a copy of this in your packets. Um, and the Petroleum Reme Remediation Program is located in the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, MPCA. Uh, petroleum is something that many of us use every day. It's in the fuel in our car, and it's how many of us heat our home. As you probably know, petroleum is stored in tanks kind of located across the state. And when the petroleum leaks from these tanks, it can pose a threat to the environment and to human health. And that's where the Petroleum Remediation Program steps in. It oversees the responses to those leak sites. Now, while the Petroleum Remediation Program staff oversee the state's response to the leak, those staff themselves are not the ones investigating the site or developing the plan for cleaning it up or conducting the cleanup. Instead, that work falls to environmental consultants. Unfortunately, what we found is that it is difficult for MPCA to hold those consultants accountable if they perform substandard work. Uh, petroleum remediation program staff request information from the consultants and approve a cleanup approach, but the program staff cannot hold the consultants directly accountable if they do a poor job. If the work is not conducted satisfactorily, for example, MPCA cannot penalize the consultants or levy a sanction or a fine. Instead, all they can do is direct the consultant to do more work at the cost of the tank owner and frankly also at the cost of the state where the staff have to provide additional oversight and resources. Oversight of the consultants is a complicated situation. It also involves the Petro Fund Board and the Department of Commerce. And frankly, it's a complicated and difficult enough situation that we think it warrants addition, additional additional attention from the legislature, excuse me. Um, so to dig into the details of this situation and then to also talk more about our findings and recommendations, I'd like to now turn to Ms. Badger, who was the manager for this evaluation. Thank you for making time for us today. Thank you. I believe uh, Ms. Badger is um, virtually here. Welcome Madam to the Chair. Welcome to the committee and proceed when ready. And, and please also identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Caitlin Badger, and I apologize. I'm having a little issue here with my screen sharing. All right, thank you for your patience, Madam Chair. Um, as I mentioned, uh, for the record, my name is Caitlin Badger. I'm with the Office of the Legislative Auditor and I was the manager for this report. I'd like to thank you again for having us here today to talk about our evaluation of the Petroleum Remediation Program. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my colleagues who assisted with this evaluation, Eleanor Berry and Will Harrison, both of whom are also with us here today. And I'd like to thank the Pollution Control Agency and their staff for their assistance throughout our evaluation. I'll start by providing a very quick roadmap of my comments today. I'll first provide a brief program overview before I highlight a few of our key findings. Then I'll provide some additional information about how the Petroleum Remediation Program operates before focusing on our findings and recommendations regarding those consultants that Ms. Randall referred to that work on release sites. I'll wrap up with a discussion about requirements regarding low risk release sites and a brief discussion about the extent to which the program considers how changes to contaminated properties could pose risks in the future. The goal of the Petroleum Remediation Program is to protect human health and the environment from risks posed by releases from petroleum storage tanks. It does this by overseeing the steps taken at release sites by the folks that ultimately address the release, such as tank owners and environmental consultants. As you can see on the map here, petroleum releases are located across the state. A release or a discharge of petroleum from a tank could result from any number of different types of situations. For example, a tank might overflow if someone overfills it, or a tank's pipes may have a loose connection that results in the leak. 
the Petroleum Remediation Program was responsible for overseeing the state's response to nearly 1,340 release sites reported in fiscal years 2017 through 2021. Nearly two thirds of those release sites occurred on commercial properties and the most commonly released types of petroleum products were gasoline, fuel oil, and diesel. So a, a few of our key findings. First, there are minimal registration requirements for consultants that work on petroleum remediation program release sites. Additionally, program staff expressed some concerns about the quality of work conducted by some consultants. However, as Ms. Randall alluded to, MPCA has limited authority in law to directly hold consultants accountable when they perform poorly. Additionally, statutes describe how MPCA must, dis must address sites that are considered a low potential risk. However, that term is not clearly defined. And finally, when making decisions about how to address a release, the program primarily focuses on risks posed by how the property is currently being used and does not generally consider how changes to that property might pose risks in the future. So a little bit more about how the program operates. After a release is reported to MPCA, the site generally goes through a four phase process. First, MPCA must identify the individual who is responsible for addressing the release. This person is referred to as the responsible party and is the tank owner or tank operator. Next, depending on the conditions at the release site, the release may undergo an investigation. After the investigation, MPCA decides whether or not the contamination at the release site needs to be remediated through soil excavation or other mitigation methods, for example. And finally, if the site meets the program's criteria for closure, MPCA staff may decide to close the case for the site. Once the case is closed, MPCA concludes its regulatory oversight of the release. It's important to note that not all release sites go through each of these four phases. MPCA uses a risk-based approach to address release sites. So in other words, the agency focuses its efforts on sites that pose a high risk to people and the environment. If MPCA decides that a site is not a high risk, then the agency may decide to let the contamination naturally degrade over time without further intervention. As we discuss more in the report, and again, as Ms. Randall alluded to, MPCA is not the only state entity that plays a role regarding petroleum tank releases. And I want to briefly introduce two state entities outside of MPCA that play an important role. First, the Petroleum Tank Release Compensation Board or the Petrofund Board provides reimbursements to responsible parties for a share of the costs they occurred or incurred in addressing the release. The board also has responsible for registering consultants and contractors that work on petroleum remediation program sites, and I'll talk about that more here shortly. The Department of Commerce, which provides staff to the Petrofund board, has the authority to censure or fine consultants and to deny or revoke their registration for a number of reasons, including if the consultant performs poor quality work. So I'm going to turn now to the critical role that consultants play at release sites. MPCA staff do not conduct site investigations or undertake mitigation activities themselves. Instead, this work is typically done by environmental consultants that are hired by the responsible party. Through their investigations, consultants determine the extent and magnitude of the release and what risks the release poses to people in the environment. If the release needs to be remediated, consultants are also responsible for conducting those cleanup or other mitigation activities and measuring the effectiveness of those interventions. Consultants communicate their findings back to MPCA throughout the process through various reports. And based on that information that the consultant provides, MPCA staff make decisions about what actions need to be taken at the release site. Because of the critical role that consultants play on release sites, a number of our findings and recommendations focus on consultants. By law, consultants and contractors must register with the Petrofund board to work on a release site. However, consultant registration requirements are minimal. As we show in the report on page 36, by law, the consultants must meet only four general criteria, such as obtaining and maintaining liability insurance and agreeing to abide by certain requirements in law. 
While statutes give the Petro Fund Board the authority to adopt rules requiring certification of environmental consultants, the board has not adopted any certification requirements. The board also does not consider a business's technical abilities when it decides whether or not to register a business. We surveyed program staff about the quality of consultant work and over half of petroleum remediation program staff said the overall quality of consultant work had a negative impact on the program's ability to meet its goals to protect human health and the environment. Similarly, over half of staff said the overall quality of consultant work negatively affected their ability to make scientifically sound decisions about release sites. As you can see on this slide, staff said poor consultant performance at least sometimes had other negative effects, including delaying case closure and creating additional costs. You can find more information about consultant performance um, as part of our survey of staff on pages 38 to 39 of our report. While staff expressed concerns about consultant performance, several staff explained that performance varies from one consultant to the next. For example, one staff person explained that some consultants provide very high quality reports while others do not. Although MPCA staff expressed continued concerns about the performance of some consultants, the program has implemented several strategies in an attempt to ensure that consultants conduct high quality work. For example, the program has created numerous guidance documents that describe how consultants should do their work. Additionally, the program has a field audit program, and as part of those field audits, program staff visit a sample of release sites to observe consultant practices out in the field and make sure that they are adhering to program guidance. However, MPCA has limited authority to directly hold consultants accountable when they find that they're performing poorly. Instead, the Petroleum Tank Release Cleanup Act gives the power to sanction or penalize consultants to the Department of Commerce. Further, because responsible parties, rather than MPCA, contract uh, for work done at these release sites, MPCA is limited in the extent to which it can hold the consultants accountable through the contracting process. MPCA staff explained to us that rather than being able to hold consultants directly accountable when they perform poorly, the agency indirectly holds consultants accountable through the responsible party. For example, through the responsible party, MPCA might direct the consultant to do more work or to redo aspects of its work. However, the costs of requiring consultants to do more work fall on the responsible party who has to pay the consultant for that additional work. And those costs also fall to the state with regard to the additional resources and staff time that are needed to address the poor consultant performance. Those consequences do not fall directly on the poorly performing consultant. Given the significant role consultants play in addressing petroleum tank releases, it's critically important that they conduct high quality work. And this is uh, why we provide several recommendations about ensuring consultants perform adequately. For example, the legislature should direct MPCA to work with the Department of Commerce in establishing a process for systematically holding consultants accountable for poor performance. As I mentioned earlier, the Department of Commerce rather than MPCA has the authority in law to sanction consultants when they perform poorly. These two agencies should figure out a formal process for communicating about repeated consultant issues so they can better hold underperforming consultants accountable. Additionally, we recommend that the legislature direct MPCA to collaborate with the Petro Fund Board to study whether it is feasible and how they might go about establishing technical qualifications needed to work at these release sites. As I mentioned earlier, the Petro Fund Board is the entity with authority in law to establish the certification requirements for consultants. I'll note that unlike consultants working on petroleum remediation program sites, businesses that install, remove, or repair underground storage tanks, including tanks that are storing petroleum products, are required by law to meet certain technical requirements. And we think that establishing minimum technical requirements for the consultants that are working on petroleum remediation program sites could reduce uh, the frequency of poor quality consultant work. I'm going to turn away now from our discussion about consultants and mention a few of our other key findings and recommendations. First, according to state law, whenever an assessment of the site determines that there is a low potential risk to human health and the environment, 
MPCA is required to address the release with passive bioremediation. Passive bioremediation is not defined in law, but it typically refers to various physical, chemical, or biological processes that degrade petroleum contamination naturally and without human intervention. In other words, for release sites that the program staff determine to be a low potential risk, statutes prohibit the agency from actively cleaning up the site. I'll note that in contrast, the Petroleum Tank Release Cleanup Act neither indicates whether MPCA is supposed to remediate release sites that it determines are a high risk, nor does it describe how the agency might go about doing so. We also found that neither law nor the Petroleum Remediation Program's guidance defines what characteristics or site conditions would make a site a low potential risk. It was also not clear whether the agency was using passive bioremediation at all sites that would be classified as low risk as required by law. Again, we have a couple of recommendations on this front. First, that MPCA define the characteristics of a site it would classify as a low potential risk, and also that the agency ensure that passive bioremediation is used at all sites classified as low potential risk as required by law. If MPCA determines there are release sites that it would classify as being a low potential risk, but for which it does not think passive bioremediation would be an appropriate approach, we suggest that MPCA recommend to the legislature that this requirement in law be amended. Last, I'd like to briefly discuss the extent to which MPCA considers how future changes to a property might pose risks resulting from petroleum contamination. As I mentioned, program staff may decide to close a release site's case when some petroleum contamination is still present at the site, as long as risks to human health and the environment have been sufficiently addressed. However, the conditions that are present at a release site when program staff decide to close the case could potentially change in the future, for example, if someone decides to redevelop the property, for example. MPCA um, program guidance largely instructs staff to consider how that property is currently used when they make site decisions and determine what steps are necessary to protect human health and the environment at the site. Program guidance generally does not instruct staff to consider if humans and the environments are sufficiently protected in the case that someone does make changes to pro the property in the future. So, for example, let's say there's an uninhabited building at a release site. When MPCA staff evaluate what risks to humans exist at the site, a staff person explained that the program determines the level of intervention necessary for the site based on the fact that there isn't anyone currently residing in that building. If MPCA was to close the case for a site and then someone were to inhabit that building on the property in the future and additional testing or intervention wasn't done to ensure the building was safe for occupancy, it's possible that building occupants could be at risk of adverse effects from the petroleum contamination. However, while guidance generally instructs staff to only consider how a property is currently used, when we surveyed staff, we found that staff actually varied in the extent to which they considered how a property might be used in the future when they made site decisions. And you can see that variation here on this slide. MPCA staff also had mixed opinions, both regarding whether it was possible to consider how a site might be used in the future and the extent to which it was important to do so. For example, some staff said that it's very difficult to know and plan for how a site Proper, a site's property or a property's um, use might change in the future. At, on the other hand, a few other staff explained limitations to not considering how a property might be used in the future and that those limitations could put folks at risk. Again, we have a couple of recommendations on this front. One, that MPCA should consider additional steps it could take to reduce, resi reduce risks resulting from future changes to petroleum contaminated properties. And also that MPCA should ensure that staff take a consistent approach in the extent to which they consider how a property may be used in the future when they make site decisions. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll wrap up my comments and I'm happy to take questions or, or turn it over to, I believe MPCA is in the audience, whatever you prefer. Thank you, Ms. Badger. I think that was a, a, a really informative presentation. Members, are there questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
First, I, I guess I want to ask a question concerning the the assertion that there doesn't seem to be enough authority to, should I say, police the registrants who, uh, consultants uh, who perform services for the remediation board. Um, you know, as I was reading through your report on page 35, it says by law the Petroleum Tank Release Compensation Board, Petrofund Board, is responsible for authorizing which consults, consultants and contractors may work on petroleum remediation program sites. Now, it goes down and, and a footnote says that the Petro Fund has the power to delegate this authority to the Department of Commerce. Now, if you have the authority, if they have the authority to do that, don't they have the authority to say, you know, your work has been substandard, therefore we're not going to uh, put you on the registered list? I, I, I fail to see why additional authority is needed, Madam Chair. Ms. Badger. Madam Chair and Senator, it's a great question. I think what we're trying to elevate is that there is authority, as you just pointed out, in law to hold consultants accountable through uh, either the Petrofund Board or through the Department of Commerce in terms of whether or not they're registered uh, and or sort of issuing sanctions. I think what we're trying to highlight in this report is that that authority rests with the Department of Commerce or with the Petrofund Board as opposed to MPCA. And MPCA is really the entity that uh, really sort of has boots on the ground, if you will, in terms of understanding what is going on at these sites and, and how these consultants are performing. And so that really is getting at the, the crux of the issue, Senator, in terms of why we're recommending this collaborative approach in that MPCA really sort of has the, the knowledge and the technical expertise to be able to evaluate the consultant performance. And we're recommending that they need to be working in greater contact and, and more systematically with those entities, Department of Commerce and the Petrofund Board that actually have the authority and law to sort of take on the, the consultant performance challenges. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, another question I have um, <clears throat> is, is the availability of con, uh, consultants, uh, though in other words, those people uh, on that list, uh, is that in short supply? Is it a question if we don't have the people there that we have that we won't have anybody? Or um, is it a situation where there's a number of those type of consultants available? Ms. Badger. Chair and Senator, again, thank you for the question. I will say in our conversations with staff, and we also surveyed consultants, and we did not hear concerns about the, the level of consultants that are available. You know, there were several hundred consultants on the list that Petro Fund, the Petrofund board puts together. But I will note, I, I think that's an important thing to consider, and, and that's one of the things I would hope that both the Petrofund board and MPCA would consider as they're thinking about certification requirements is obviously there needs to be a sufficient supply of contractors and, and consultants. And we haven't heard any concerns about that at this point in the game. But for example, if they were to make um, certification requirements so stringent, you know, really take it to the extreme that um, they maybe, you know, would reduce that pipeline of consultants, I think that would be something to think about. So we haven't heard that as a, as a consideration or a concern at this point in the game, but I, I think that's an important point in terms of thinking as they move forward about certification requirements. Senator Weber. Thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you, Ms. Badger. We appreciate your presentation today. Thank you. With that, we have with us uh, Mr. Kadelka and Ms and Jamie Wallerstead. Thank you, welcome to the committee. So please identify yourself for the record and proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Chair and committee members. For the record, my name is Kirk Adelka. I'm the Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and I work on land issues. I have with me today a colleague, uh, Jamie Wallerstead, who is our Division Director for the Remediation Division. I'll start off with our, our remarks, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about the report. And I also want to thank the Office of the Legislative Auditor and its staff for the time spent learning about our Petroleum Remediation Program and providing outside perspective and constructive feedback on our program. 
We're proud of this program. We're proud of its outcomes and our committed staff who work tirelessly to oversee prompt and thorough investigation of petroleum remediation sites. Through this program, the agency has advanced our mission to protect and improve the environment and human health, and specifically by ensuring all Minnesotans have safe drinking water. The OLA's evaluation reaffirms our work. It's an example is in the survey of professionals in this field, both inside our building and outside. Overwhelmingly agree, we are achieving our goals of protecting human health and the environment. The EPA has recognized our achievements in operating the program. Minnesota is the only state within Region 5 that meets its goals for addressing contaminated underground storage tank sites. And EPA has also acknowledged our willingness to continuously improve, not only by incorporating new science and technology into our programs, but also using that information to look back at old contaminated sites using this new knowledge that was not available at times decisions were made at those sites. We're commu committed to improving and improvement, and we have built a culture where learning is valued. As such, we will use the OLA's recommendations to further improve the program. As the OLA's evaluation notes, we previously started some continuous improvement projects that once completed can help address some of the recommendations. We also have some additional ideas to address other of the recommendations. I'd like to take just a little bit of time to touch on some of the OLA's recommendations and efforts we're taking to address them or plan to in the future. The first one is in regards to the quality of consultants' work. We agree with the OLA's findings that when consultants produce poor work products, it has a negative impact on our efforts. However, these incidences are limited. It is also true MPCA has no direct authority or ability to penalize the consultant who is hired by the responsible party to carry out this work. However, we believe it's important to provide some context on what authorities the MPCA does have to ensure contaminated sites are properly addressed. Owners and operators of storage tanks are responsible for addressing any spills or releases that occur. The owners and the operators are ultimately the responsible party for this work. Consultants are just hired to complete the work. The agency has clear authorities over responsible parties and exercises these authorities to ensure the contamination is properly addressed. When consultants' work doesn't meet our standards, we ask them to do it over again through the responsible parties. This at times we agree may cause delays, but it's important to note it doesn't impact the quality of our work done at these contaminated sites. We've taken an effort to prevent it from ever getting to this problem. The program provides guidance, as mentioned, but also training consultants, including our consultants day. We also have a field audit program where we make unannounced visits to check on the quality of consultants' work. The agency concurs with the OLA's finding that additional improvements are needed, and it's why we've launched the first phase of the Report, Evaluation, and Performance Oversight Team, also referred to as REPORT. It's a start of an effort to improve the quality of materials submitted by consultants. We're also willing to work with the legislature, the Department of Commerce, and the Petroleum Fund Board to discuss other strategies to satisfy this recommendation. In regards to evaluating risk from contamination, the Petroleum Mediation Program utilizes a risk-based approach to address petroleum releases. It's a well-defined and studied method implemented by all their states and Minnesota's specific approach is approved by the EPA. We don't put Minnesotans' health on a sliding scale. The agency divides contaminated sites into two categories. As the OLA acknowledges, we clearly define their criteria for a high-risk site, which potentially poses the greater risk to human health and the environment. These sites also need are the ones that need corrective actions. By default, all their sites are considered low-risk and can be addressed by passive bioremediation or no action due to the low risk presented. OLA's recommendation is that we clearly define low risk sites. We can easily accomplish this by more clearly articulating that high low risk definition relationship between the low risk sites are those that, um, by clearly stating low risk sites are those that do not meet the criteria of being a high risk site. We can also tag sites as low or high risk in our database to aid in future tracking as suggested. In regards to considering future risk, as much as possible, the MPCA considers future risk of a potential exposure to contamination. However, this is a very complex issue because of several conditions could change in the future that we may not be aware of today. 
For example, how a site is used, new toxicity data on the contaminant, or science and technology improvements. As a result, there is no one single mechanism that completely guarantees protection. It's why we use a belt and suspenders approach, where multiple mechanisms are stronger than any one alone. It's important that several parties play a role in this to protect against unknown future risk. This process really consists of four parts. The first is MPCA and our staff considering future risks at the time of the corrective actions when we know, for instance, a change in the future design of the property or local zoning that may have it as a different type of use. The second is owners and sellers. They must disclose information about contamination under their proper, uh, on their property under specific and general authorities already in state law. MPCA, we worked with the Minnesota Realtors to improve this system by adding prompt questions in the standard real estate transaction disclosure materials to help draw this information out at the time of sale. The third is buy buyers and new owners. They have the ability to access many tools on the MPCA's website. And have, and for instance, our Minnesota Groundwater's Contamination Atlas, which is improving by adding more sites to it and is something that the legislature has helped us fund and we appreciate that support. The fourth is developers and lenders. It's standard lending practice for developers to obtain assurances for contaminated sites, or excuse me, contaminated issues are addressed based on the type of the proposed new development. The MPCA's Brownfield program was created to assist in these specific situations. We agree with the recommendation further review could benefit this area of future risk. And to meet the recommendation, we can utilize an existing future risk continuous improvement project selected by our staff and supported by leadership that is part of our consistency and cleanup effort. In summary, we appreciate the OLA's evaluation of the Petroleum Remediation Program and its recognition of the outcomes of our dedicated and hardworking staff. Our agency strives to be a learning organization with a culture that values innovation and ingrains improvement into our everyday work. We will use the OA's evaluation in our effort to continuously improve the quality of our work in order to achieve our goals. We are committed to our mission to protect our environment and the health of all Minnesotans. Thank you, Chair and Committee members, for your time. Thank you. Ms. Wallerstead, welcome to the committee. Hi, my name is Jamie Wallerstead. Um, I'm the Remediation Division Director uh, for the MPCA, and Assistant Commissioner Kadelka and I are, are, we stand for questions. Thank you. Members, are there questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Kadelka, you heard the uh, Legislative Auditor's Report earlier where it talked about possibly needing additional legislative authority in order to control the quality of the consultant's work. Do you feel that that's something that's, that's necessary? Mr. Kadelka. Chair and committee members, we do believe there's improvements needed here. The MPCA has been working on helping educate and training consultants along with looking back at some of this um, through our uh, field audit program, but we do believe improvements need to be made. We're happy to work with the legislature, Department of Commerce and uh, Petroleum Board, um, Petroleum Fund Board to see if those are things that need to be improved in those programs or more authorities given to the agency. But we do agree more improvement needs to be made on consultants' work products. Senator Weber. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I'm just curious as to why you feel that need, you need that when you went ahead with promulgating California car rules, which is clearly a a policy decision that should belong to the legislature, and you went ahead and, and did it without any input from, from the legislature. So thank you, Madam Chair. Other questions? Senator Sengem. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Kadaka, just uh, thinking about this whole program, uh, and I, I in another life was probably involved in 10 to 15 of these, but what what do you think the the what what is your objective is there's a there's, there's a tank in, in the ground and it's and it's leaked what is what is the goal of the mpca on that what mr. What, what what is the end result that you want mr kadelka mr chair and committee members our goal is to make sure human health and the environment is protected 
And that means uh, for various sites, the sites um, specifics of the contamination that will drive what type of corrective actions may or may not be needed, and what type of actions may be needed to mitigate potential risk to human health and the environment. It is unfortunate uh, once a release occurs, we may not be able to clean up all the contamination at the site. So our focus is really on what is the risk to human health and the environment and how can we best address that. Senator Sinjim. Well, and, and Madam Chair, and just to go back to this thing about our, our consultants. Uh, so so you, you, you find a leaking storing tank, tank you, you dig it up, you, you, you'll, you know, there's devices that you can monitor the surrounding soil and, and, and look for hydrocarbons. Uh, that's, that's really pretty easy. Uh, where it gets difficult, and at least in the experience I've had, is where you get into bedrock, and uh, and then what, uh, and uh, yeah, you know, and then what, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> unless you want to, you know, start digging into bedrock, uh, and you don't know how how deep that's going to be, why you've got a you've got a big job there. But uh, I'm just wondering, you know, this isn't rocket science, you know. You, you dig it up, you, 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 if you will, sniff the soil, you can find out where the, the boundaries are, generally speaking, if, if you don't have a lot of leakage. And, and you take care of that and you remediate that, uh, that, that uh, contaminated soil. And you don't remediate it, you, you, know, you process it through, through ways that we have to do that. Uh, I, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud about you know, the, the consultant and, uh, and it seems to me that, you know, that uh, an owner, a responsible party, you, you, you just hire, you hire qualified people, and we, we kind of all know who they are if you're at all involved in this, uh, uh, because of just their stature within the industry, so to speak. But uh, maybe I just ask this: Are, are there are a lot of are, are there a lot of run of the night, if you will, so-called consultants out there that uh, claim to be able to do this and, and, and get hired? Is that what? And I think he actually said that we don't see a lot of problems with consultants, but of those that you do, are are they are they working for reputable firms, or are they just single single people out there that hang a shingle up? Mr. Kadelka, the chairing committee members, you know, I think it it can be a mix. We can have a very good uh, consultant company, and they may have one employee that uh, performs work substandard to the rest of the the group, or it could be. A firm, a small firm on there. So it really does vary. Um, and I'm just going to see if there's anything else that I, I think that's, you know, it, it is hard to, to say there's one rule that governs why there is a, a poor, poor performing consultant. It could be for many reasons. Senator Sinjim. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll just leave it. I could go on and on. I mean, um, uh, there were times when it, you know, we'd question the, the, the PCA, too, on monitoring wells and, you know, what's, what's the use? Uh, <laughs> what do they accomplish? You know, we can, we, we can, you can ask for monitoring wells, we put them in, and uh, we'd monitor them for 10 years and give you the results, and, and then what? Uh, how long do we do this? Because it's, it's not, you know, in, in most cases it would, it would dissipate, but, you know, it, it's there, it's there. There's a point in time where you can't dig it up reasonably. But on the other hand, it's probably not a great environmental threat either. The end. <laughs> Senator McEwen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to, I know our time is up. I just wanted to say thank you very much for this report. Um, really appreciate the information from it. Appreciate so much the work of our agency to protect the public health, to protect our environment, and everything that you can do to hold these um, independent contractors responsible um, to furthering that mission. That mission, um, you have my full support of, for that work, and um, I just wanted to express my thanks um, for that really, really important work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Are there any other discussion? Senator Sindrum. Uh So, so my association with all this is, you know, 10 years old or so, but uh, the, the newer tanks, uh, are they coated and so on and so forth, so they apt to, they're less apt to, to leak, uh, or double-walled or anything like that? What do we have out there technologically now? 
Mr. Kudelka. Chairing committee members, we do have requirements on underground storage tanks, as you mentioned, and the federal government, along with the state, have rules that govern that, and it's a, a separate program than what is talked about here in the OLA report. But you're right, we have made advancements in there to requiring to make sure there are protections, whether some um, making sure the fuels are compatible with the type of material built there. Sometimes it may be double walled, sometimes it might be the type of material, and various pieces of equipment for testing and monitoring to make sure it operates. And as a result, that preventive work of the underground storage tank program and those regulations, whether federal and state, have helped us have less releases as a result. But we still, unfortunately, do have releases at times and also still finding historical releases that we are, are out there as folks develop in new areas that we may not have been aware of a release previously. Senator Sinton. Thank you so much, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Thank you for coming today from the MPCA, and thank you to the OLA's office. It's a um, very informative uh, report today, very important report. And members, with no further business between, in front of our committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and committee members. <laughs>